As you turn uh, with me in your Bibles to Philippians 4, 14 through 23 is going to be the text this morning. As you turn there, let us pray. Father, we do ask that you would speak to us. Lord, that we would submit to your authority in our life. And Lord, that we would see more of your will being accomplished, your good and pleasing and perfect will in this world in which we live, and that we would be in line with your will. So Lord, touch our hearts and minds and our spirits, and sanctify us in your mighty, powerful, and loving name, amen. So Philippians chapter 4, we are finishing up Philippians this morning. We will be going into Romans next, and um, I am excited about that, just as I have been excited as we go going through Philippians. Romans is going to be a long journey. It may take us three to four years to get through that, Uh, and we will be taking breaks along the way. The reason is this is four chapters, Philippians, and we've been in this since October, and so Romans is much bigger in in fact, Romans is 14 chapters, and so, and it's also more in depth in theology than uh, most other books in the New Testament. So we will be uh, spending quite some time in Romans. But we are finishing up Philippians, so let's dig in together and finish well as we read the last part of this book. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice, acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So, as we dig into this text, obviously you can see it it deals with giving. It deals with support, financial support, and the relationship that Paul has with the church in Philippi. We see this close, connected relationship and the supportive relationship that Paul has And the impact that they were having throughout the world as they give and as they send out Paul as an apostle and support him in his missionary endeavors. And we see that it even affects Caesar's own household, that Caesar's household greets this church. Can you imagine hearing that? Uh, That the most powerful person in all of the world at the time, that his own household greets this church. This church was having a massive impact. And it all comes from a relationship, a very close relationship with Paul, the missionary. And and yet we can see how all throughout Scripture, God created us to have relationships. He's created us to have relationship with Him. And the Godhead is a perfect example of what true relationship is all about. We have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this perfect relationship where there is perfect peace and love and unity, even to the point of Christ submitting to the will of the Father, even in His flesh coming down to earth that there is perfect unity in that Godhead. There's this relationship that's perfect, and then he creates us, not out of neediness, but out of 
Just that's who he is. And he gets to exercise his sovereign plan through us. And he gets to love us and show us unconditional love. And, and we see this relationship that we have with God and that we are to have relationship with one another. And all throughout Philippians, we have studied about the relationship of people in the church and how they are to be obedient to Christ and pursue one another, and be unified with one mind, and to think of others as more significant than yourself. This church had such a strong relationship with Paul that they supported him even when nobody else did at the very beginning of his ministry. This takes us back to Acts 16, verse 20 through 39. Turn with me there. This sheds light on the relationship that Paul had with this church. Because authentic faith produces healthy and supportive relationship. That is what we see. Authentic faith in God is the rock that brings us together as believers. And oh, how we need it today. I met with some pastors this last week and... um, some lay people as well, black and white. We met right here at Riverside. We took a video of this because we're hoping that it would have an impact on somebody out there, that they would see that we, the church, are to be the light in this time, that we are to listen to one another. As James says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, And so we met together in the midst of all the chaos of broken relationships around. Here we were, racial diversity, but united as brothers in Christ. And we had such a sweet time of sharing our points of view on this. And we were able to be candid with one another. And then we, we dealt with the most important question of all. How does the gospel affect the racial division that we see in our country? How does the gospel affect that? And we went right back. I took these guys right back to Philippians 2. Everybody had their, perspe- their perspective on it. But for me, the Philippians 2 just stuck out to me. Because he, he says, consider others more important than yourselves. And this is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the very nature of God, living in heaven, came down, submitted himself, made himself nothing, humbled himself for you and for me. And then while he was here, he went out of his way to go into Samaria, even though there was this incredible racial divide. And Jesus went out of his way. And we think that's a big deal, but that's nothing compared to him coming down out of heaven and going out of his way to redeem us and to love us and to walk in our shoes. And so he says, Therefore, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You, be obedient to Christ. You represent him. You bear the name of Christ the Messiah, Lord Jesus. And when people see you, they need to see him. And so we need to take that seriously. And it all is applicable. These aren't just theological truths that we apply to our minds and not to our lives. They change our life. They cause us to to crucify ourselves and to sacrifice our own comforts so that we can love others well because that is what our Savior did for us. And so that is relationship That is relationship inside the church. And we are to be the light of the world, the city on the hill, and people are to know us by our love for one another. And so we had an awesome time of listening to one another. And I thought to myself of how this needs to happen more often. I thought to myself of the funeral. The last time I saw another pastor in our community was at this funeral, a black pastor. I saw him at this funeral. And and he told me, he said, when I... When I started to have a relationship with you and have a love for you was when I saw you at that funeral. He said, you were completely like a fish out of water. 
This was a totally different atmosphere for you. You had all kinds of, I was asking them all kinds of questions. What's going on? What's next? And what are they doing now? And am I going to be speaking? Yeah, you're probably going to be speaking. Okay, uh, I better be ready. You know, it was just totally different than what I was used to. And he said, but when you got up and spoke, it was like you were just one of us. And I said, that's because of the word of God. That's because we are brothers in Christ. And the word of God is, is, is the power. The gospel is the power of salvation for the Jew and the Gentile across racial barriers. And we need that desperately today. We need close relationships. So here is Paul in Acts 16. And he's with the Gentiles. He's ministering to the Gentiles. And if you know Paul... He wanted to reach the Jews. He said, I, I, would, I would like die myself for my fellow Jewish brothers to come to know Christ as their Savior. And yet, where was Paul sent to mainly? The Gentiles. That is who he reached more than the Jews. And so here he is, a fish out of water with the Gentiles. And you know that the Jews looked at the Gentiles as pagans. Jesus said this as he talked to the disciples. He said, even the Gentiles do that. Even the Gentiles. Why does Jesus say that? Because in their mind, the Gentiles did not have the law, and they lived for just themselves. And so today, for us as the church, that is people outside of the church. And we see God sending Paul to those people. And these people see the authentic faith of Paul, and it changes everything. Authentic faith changes everything. It makes me think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer as he was about to die, and he would pray in his cell. He wouldn't give up his friends. And he stood for truth and righteousness and because of his love for Christ. And so there was this guard this Nazi guard that was looking through his cell door and he saw Dietrich Bonhoeffer praying and he said, I was inspired in an awe of this man and his genuine faith, praying with such earnesty and such authenticity. And he said, it just impacted, I just wanted that. I wanted some of that in my life. And so we see that throughout the ages in Christianity. That authentic faith has more impact than anything else, than logical debate. I love to talk about apologetics. I love to prove my faith to people. I, I like to talk about what is true. But more than that, way more than that is my testimony. And that has way more of an impact than ever winning an argument of any kind. Your testimony, church, you need to know this. Your testimony is more powerful than any argument you could ever win. It's with that mindset that I want us to see what happens here in Acts 16. Acts 16, 20. We're going to start in verse 20 and go through to verse 39. It's a beautiful story, and you've read it many times, and I pray that God would speak to you afresh and anew today as he has me. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in, attacking them. So here's that mob crowd that we've seen today. The riots, running justice. The crowd joined in, attacking them. And the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. 
And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had, to, that he had believed in God. But it, when it was day, the magistrate sent the police, saying, let, these, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. What a beautiful account. What an example to us today. Church, listen up here. Look at Paul's testimony here. He is unjustly with a crazed mob screaming out, and the magistrates have them beaten to appease this mob. This is fast justice in their mindset, but it's not justice at all. There's been no trial. This is just mob mentality. He's beaten, it's unjust. I know some people in our own city that experience injustice. That I know Moundford Methodist right down the road got broken into. Casey's I go by and there's boarded up windows. There's some chaos that's come to our own city and we're just little Decatur. We're not even big Chicago or New York City where there's all kinds of stuff going on. Murdering going on. Unjustice, mob mentality. And what do we see here? What does Paul do? Does he come out of prison demanding his rights? How dare they do this to me? Fleeing, forgetting what his mission was? This is a beautiful example of someone who had bigger fish to fry. Paul recognized that this man was lost. This jailer was going to commit suicide probably because everything he did in life, his identity in life was in what he did for a living, and that was being a good jailer and making sure that he did his job well. Worrying about the, the shame that he might experience and being taken away and, and him put in jail or killed himself because he didn't do his job well. And so he was going to kill himself. And Paul says, wait, guys, let's not go anywhere. We have bigger fish to fry. This guy needs to know Jesus. And he shares the gospel with them. And this man is so moved by, probably heard the singing at night of them singing hymns and wondering, how do they do that? Being in prison, locked up in stocks, beaten, bloody, bruised. How do they sing to God in the midst of that? It makes me think of a time in Haiti when, when after the earthquake and a, an atheist doctor was in, was in Haiti and he was, he was there just just working on people and, and, and they didn't even have uh, anesthesia they could give to somebody where they would put them to sleep. All they could do was local anesthesia and they just gave this, this woman a shot in her leg and then they cut off her leg and as they were cutting off her leg, she was singing hymns to God and this doctor who was an atheist said, I, I just don't understand that. Mission of Hope told me about this story as we went into the the operating room where this happened. They said, I feel like I'm stepping into holy ground when I walk in here because the faith of a poor Haitian woman that was having her leg chopped off, God used it to bring a rich doctor from America to Jesus because that rich doctor may have had everything, but he had nothing. And that Haitian woman may have had nothing, but she had everything. You see, that is a powerful testimony. And that testimony 
is something that people need to hear about today and they need to know. What is your salient identity in the midst of all this confusion and chaos? What is your number one goal in the midst of all this chaos? I hope, church, that it is to shine out the light of Christ. I was so blessed to see Mountford Methodist as they were broken into that they said on the news, we forgive the person who did this to us. I was on my way to Riverside. And you see, this is the Spirit of God inside of us, the power of the gospel that, that gives us the testimony that we have. And I'm, I'm driving to church, and I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do if our church is broken into? What am I going to do? Everybody was asking me this, and I hadn't heard anything about how, what happened at Riverside. And so I came here in the morning. The first thing that I wanted to do was see our church. And then Jesus said this, what you will do is you will is what I did. And that's you're going to say, forgive them for they know not what they do. And you need to have that in your heart. You see, that same spirit in me, it crumbs across denominational lines to my brothers over there in Mountford Methodist. That they said the same thing. That is the power of God. You see, we have bigger fish to fry than demanding our own rights. So Paul, he didn't demand his own rights. No, he didn't run out of prison mad, angry, he had bigger fish to fry, and he wanted this jailer to see the contentment that he talks about in Philippians, the peace that passes all understanding, the joy of the Lord, and not having any fear whatsoever. You know, I think I'd be a little scared. You know what? I, the, the walls are down. I'm out of here. I'm not going through one of those beatings again. In my flesh, that's exactly what I would be doing. I'm getting out of here. I'm going to get out of this town. Maybe I'll go and make a big stink about this and, and, and tell everybody about how I was treated, how I was treated wrong. But no, we don't see Paul doing that. First, first and foremost, he shows this jailer the contentment and the peace that passes all understanding. And he is willing to take another beating or he would not have stayed there. He's willing to take whatever's coming to him this jailer, I wonder what's going through his head. He took a risk too. And not just fastening him back up. He took a risk in that he brought him into his house. He washed their wounds. And then they had this baptism. And this is the beginning of the church in Philippi. And then notice, Paul then uses his Roman citizenship to create freedom for this church. I, I believe that the Philippian church experienced freedom. And you don't see Paul addressing any persecution in, in, in Philippians like he does in other, other churches. Like you don't see your first Peter, it's way more about persecution and suffering. And here in Philippi, you don't see that. He deals more with the problems within the church. And, and, and you see he, in, in here in Acts 16, he says, no, you, you let them condemn us publicly because we're, we're going we're gonna to hold our, to our rights here and we're going to, to, to pursue freedom. And so then they apologized. So they came and apologized to him in verse 39. You see, this was a very good start to a church that was just getting off the grounds. And this church had seen the authenticity of Paul's faith. So church, know this, your faith, your testimony, the authenticity of your faith has more impact than anything you can say online on social media. Show people the love of Christ. Show people peace. Show people the gospel through how you live and share your testimony boldly. It was a man that I reached out to for about a year here in this community and uh, he was an atheist didn't know if he'd ever come to, come to know Christ. He had some good friends that went to this church. And he started to wonder if maybe Christianity is true. He wanted to meet with us. We met with him. I had this couple come. This couple never went through any evangelism training that I know of. I didn't take them through any evangelism training. 
But I told him this before we met with this guy. I said, hey, listen, I just want you to do this. I know you guys know Jesus as your Savior. I want you guys to share when you came to know Christ as your Savior, specifically how that happened, and then how God has changed your life since then. And they shared that with this man, and I shared my testimony with this man. Some of us uh, through tears. And by the end, this man, he said, I want what you have. I want that. Because I asked him, I said, well, what do you think about this? He said, I want that. Because he saw genuine faith. He saw the power of the gospel in someone's life. May we live that way in the midst of all that's going on. May we live with knowing that the gospel is powerful. It changes lives. Don't be intimidated by sharing Jesus with people. Share with them what he's done for you. Like the man born blind where the Pharisees were attacking him and trying to trip him up and get him to deny that Jesus was without sin. And he says, hey, guys, 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 listen, I don't know how to answer all your questions. All I know was that I was blind and now I see. So that is the power that we have. How are you blind and now you see? And the world that does what they're doing because they don't understand all of the angst and the fears and the, the anger inside of them, that world needs Eyes to see the glory of the risen Christ and, and, and that that changes everything. So live that way. So first we see that, this relationship that Paul has, this close, supportive relationship that comes out of authenticity of faith. They were fully in with Paul, completely supporting him. They knew that he was going to have an impact. And because of that, they were going to have a lot of fruit from giving to Paul. And he addresses that here. He says, not that I seek the gift. Why does he say that? Because Paul is content. He knows that God's going to provide for him. I know what it is to have plenty. And I know what it is to have nothing. I found the secret of contentment no matter what. So he says, I don't really seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I love you so much, Philippians. I want to see you experience the fruit that comes from being obedient to Christ. You are giving sacrificially, and you are going to have a lot of fruit that will last for eternity. You see, when you give, that fruit lasts for eternity. Give to kingdom work above all else. Above all else. Because anything else, if you're like me, you get asked all the time to give to things. All the time there's something to give to. There's a social justice issue or some kind of thing to support or give to. And I know as like some older people in a church, they've, had, they've asked me, what do you think about this? And, you know, I get, I get hounded a lot. You know, they give to a lot of things, so they get hounded all the time to give. And I want to encourage you, just make sure the giving is for kingdom work above all else because everything else just fades it doesn't last into eternity. I was, uh, uh, our church used to help random people with their electric bills and, um, and food and housing. We helped them pay rent, just random people in our community. And it, we were trying to be a light and care for people's needs. But the problem was we never saw any of these people ever darken the door of our church. It was like a social justice type thing. And so we decided, you know what, this is not really bringing about much fruit. And our name got out there, and we was like the gravy train, you know, Riverside's on that gravy train. And so what we decided to do for our church was, was give and help needs of people that we can help grow in their relationship with Jesus. People that are connected to our church, people that go to our church, we can, we can kind of help them with their finances, give them some Dave Ramsey principles, and, and help them grow. Because it's, it's much, much more difficult to teach someone to fish than just to throw some fish at them. And we care about their soul and their walk with Jesus more than anything else. So that's why we decided to do that. In Matthew 26, 9 through 11, Jesus said this. This has to do with poor. This has to do with social justice. Matthew 26, 9 through 11. For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. This is his disciples. Actually, I'm going to go back to eight. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? 
For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. This is the woman who is pouring out the expensive ointment at Jesus' feet. She knows that Jesus is loving and forgiving and she is feeling that love and she pours it out, worshiping him at his feet. And, and Jesus, they're like, oh, what about the poor? Why, why not care about, you know, for the Philippians, it could have been easy for them to just, to just go with whatever's popular in society. Hey, let's help the poor in our community. The Romans will like that. It will look good. Let's just throw a bunch of money at the poor. No, they were kingdom-minded. This doesn't mean you don't help out the poor. There are definitely times for that, but you do it with the goal of sharing the gospel. Jesus healed people, but the reason why he healed them was so that he could give them the gospel because they were just going to die someday anyways and they needed eternal life. So it was a means to an end. That's what we give towards. One time when I was a youth pastor, we, uh, we would do a lot of different fun things to try to bring in kids, and we had a lot, of, a lot of energetic kids in our youth group. We saw kids come to know Christ. It was exciting. Well, we did fun things, you know, and sometimes we spent money on these things. We tried to be careful with our youth budget, but the goal was to reach the lost for the, for the gospel. And so one time, we had oatmeal wrestling, where you got oatmeal, just big old huge pots of oatmeal and poured it. And everybody made all this oatmeal. We poured it in this big huge kiddie pool. And it was like you had to wrestle past this person and touch the person's hand on the other side. And it was hilarious and fun. They had tons of fun. And it's all slippery and nasty. And, 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 and then we had a devotional time after that. You know, it was a fun thing. And I remember somebody saying once, like, you know, this, this oatmeal would be better spent uh, giving to the poor. And, and, and I'm like, okay, I, I see where they're coming from because it does seem like we're wasting this. But the goal of this is that we can, we can bring kids, have a fun time, and share Jesus with them. That's our goal. It's why every, our church has a youth budget. Why do we have fun with our youth? The goal of having fun, why don't we just give that money to the poor in our community? The goal of having fun is to share the gospel with these kids and to disciple them. That is always the goal. And I believe that that is fruit that will last. This church was going to have eternal pleasures forevermore. For we're told in the Old Testament that at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. They were going to have pleasures forevermore for they were storing up treasures in heaven and not on this earth. And in fact, their legacy is still going out today. And it's still having impact today as I'm preaching on it. And it's impacting you. I hope that it is. Next, we see that Paul is fully supplied. He is fully supplied. Now, notice, this comes out of a heart of contentment. Paul had the secret of contentment. And so, because of that, he didn't have any angst of thinking, you know, I better not tell them that I'm fully supplied because if I do, they might stop giving and, 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 and I, I might need money down the road. What if I shipwreck and I lose a lot of my stuff? And what if, what if, what if? No, Paul was confident to say, guys, I'm fully supplied. You guys are blessing me and, and pouring out the blessings on me. And, and, and church, some of the most popular evangelists are televangelists. And they make millions of dollars. Benny Hinn is worth $60 million. Kenneth Copeland is worth $300 million with private jets in his own private airport. That's not what I see here with Paul. And these guys are always saying, give me more, give me more. If you give me some, then you will have money. You're going to get rich if you give me some. And it's this constant manipulation. We don't see any manipulative behavior with Paul because the Spirit of God had inspired these words through him out of an authentic faith that came out of a contentment and a peace that passed all understanding. And he wasn't worried about the future. And so he was able to honestly tell the church, you have fully supplied me. Thank you for doing that. May we also live with that confidence that God will supply all of our needs, just like he will the Philippians. See, Paul is like, I am perfectly content. God has supplied all my needs. 
And you know what, church? He's going to do the same for you. Rest in that peace. Know that he is going to provide all your needs. Don't hold on to every last dollar that you can for yourself. Ask God, God, what do you want to do with what, what do you want me to do with what you have given me? Lastly, we see with this is that we are to give sacrificially. This church gave sacrificially. Notice this phrase here. A fragrant offering in verse 18. He says, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. This is Old Testament terminology. Okay, this takes us back to the Old Testament. The fragrant offering was the sacrifice, the sacrifice of the lamb, roasted and, and burned as a sacrifice. And that lamb was without blemish. That was the perfect lamb. That was your best lamb. And so when they sacrificed that lamb, it was their best we, of course, know that that pointed to Christ, the perfect Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But also, it was an example that we are to give our best to God. And then he says, so not only the, the fragrant offering, but also a, a sacrifice pleasing to God. A sacrifice pleasing to God. That sacrifice, that, and then he talks about this, the first fruit but I seek the, the fruit that increases to your credit. Okay? I don't know if you ever had a garden before. How many of you have gardens out there? And that was another thing that Israel did is they gave of their, their produce. And, and they gave their first fruits to God. And they sacrificed in that way. It was a sacrifice. When I have a garden, usually I, I, if I have tomatoes... I might get tons of tomatoes, or zucchinis especially, get tons of zucchinis. And usually when I give those to somebody, and I'm just going to be honest with you, I give them after I have gotten all that I need. And then I give others out of my abundance, because I don't need all this fruit. It's really not a sacrifice at all for me. It's just extra fruit that I don't, that's just going to rot. And I know that many times, you know, the fall comes, harvest time, we get tons of tomatoes in here. And it's probably, you probably do the same thing. But church, let that not be how we give to the Lord. Let it not be that we give to the Lord out of the leftovers of what we have. I have an extra amount, so I guess I can give just a little bit. You know, it has been said that in the Old Testament, the, the, uh, the, in the old, under the Old Covenant, people were told to tithe 10%. And we don't see that in the New Testament. And so, you know, maybe, uh, maybe God doesn't need us to give 10% now. And there's all this talk about what should we tithe? What's the right amount to tithe? And my concern about that is, and I see the point there, but my concern about that is, is usually it's a way to say, I don't really have to give that much, and I can give maybe 2%, or I can give just what I'm comfortable with. And I think that is not biblical whatsoever. It is not biblical whatsoever. Rather, we see Jesus and how he talks about giving. He talks about giving out of sacrifice. And that's what we see Paul here. It is a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice that is pleasing to God because we know the great sacrifice that he gave to us in giving himself and dying on a cross. And so we do this out of love. We give out of love to God and trusting that he's going to supply all our needs. And so we give to him out of love and out of worship, out of a a pure heart, not begrudgingly, because it's all his. I want to take you back to Mark 12, verse 41 through 44. Here's an example. And Jesus didn't say, oh, you guys are given 10%. You don't have to do that anymore. He never said that. Rather, he saw the rich giving 10%, and that was to them like a check off of their list. Okay, 10%, I'm good. And they did it publicly. They did it braggingly, like cha-ching, 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 just letting it all drop in there, letting it rain, right? And everybody's looking at them like, wow, these guys have a lot of money and they really gave a lot. And Jesus just hammered them because Jesus knew that they had so much money that they could give 50% and it wouldn't even touch them financially. 
These people had servants. These people didn't have to work a day in their life. And, and Jesus said, okay, I just want you guys to notice something. All right? And he points this person out. Mark 12, 41 through 44. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance. Notice that, out of their abundance. It was the extra amount that they had, the 10%, but it was the extra amount. No sacrifice whatsoever. But she, out of her poverty, has put everything she had all she had to live on. Jesus is like, that is someone who has faith. That is someone who has love for God. And nobody sees it. And he says, I want to I point that out. You see, that is how we are to give to the Lord. It's all his. My house is his. My car is his. Lord, what do you want me to do to serve you with the fruits of of my labor. What do you want me to do? Because you have given me good health. You have given me my job. You have given me all the, given me this country to live in. I am so blessed and I have my cup overflowing. And so I want to give sacrificially in worship to you, Lord Jesus. May it never be that we give just out of our extra amount. May it never be that we that we justify, ah, 10% was the Old Testament. I can give like whatever. May we give like this church did. Sacrificially, a pleasing offering, a fragrant offering of sacrifice. Listen, church, God is, I'm not preaching this. I, I, I came to this text. I'm not preaching this text because it's the COVID-19 thing and we're struggling as a church. We're okay. I've been blessed to see how people continue to give in the midst of this. Praise the Lord for that. So it's not out of that. It's rather, that's what the Word of God says. And I pray that you would have the blessing of having open hands, free from the love of money, saying, Lord, use these talents, use these things that you've given me, to advance your kingdom in a world that is desperately in need of your love and your grace and your gospel, as I just talked about in the beginning, is desperate in seeing the gospel and knowing you and knowing the risen Christ and being freed from all the anger and chaos and unforgiveness and racial divide. Oh, Lord Jesus, we need a healing in our land. Use me, Lord Jesus. Take what I have and use it for your glory. And one last thing I'd just like to say when it comes to money. The Bible gives us, gives us really three things. Well, four things to do. One is to get out of debt. Get out of debt, church. If you're in debt, get out of debt. Save. Enjoy the fruit of your labor. There's some of that too. Okay? And do it out of worship to him. Lord, thank you for what you've given me. I thank you that I get to enjoy this vacation with my family or whatever it is. And then give big. Be free from debt. You know how many Christians are in bondage to debt. And so it's hard for them to give to God's kingdom. To give to their church. To support missions. And they're just strapped. They're in slavery. The... the Whoever is in debt is enslaved to the lender. So get out of that. Do all that you can. Be disciplined. It's going to take sacrifice. You can go through a Dave Ramsey course, and, and really, it's just simple. you got to sacrifice, and you got to be wise, and get out of debt, and save, and, and then enjoy giving big for God, as this church did, and storing up those treasures in heaven. It is a blessing. And some of the people that I know that have the most joy and peace in their lives are the most giving people I know. Some of them have a lot of money. Some of them have hardly anything. But they love to give 
And life isn't about them. And they have the joy and contentment and peace that Paul is talking about here. Let us close in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for such a beautiful example of the church of Philippi. Lord, for Paul's relationship with them, a Jew with Gentiles. Lord, for his authentic faith. Lord, for a faith that persevered in the face of beatings. A faith that lived for one purpose alone, and that is for the gospel. Lord, help us to have that same faith. Lord, to put all other things aside, all other agendas aside, whether it be political or, or, or material or, or whatever it is, Lord, or career-oriented, Lord, put all those agendas as, as submissive to the number one goal to see people come to know you as their Savior. Oh, Lord, help us, Lord Jesus. Fill us with your Spirit. Help us to live this way. And may we see some healing in our land here in America. We need it badly. In your name, amen.